ليس اليتيم الذي قد مات والده إن اليتيم يتيم العلم والأدب Assalamu alaikum all and welcome to another episode of Influential Muslim brought to you by Islamic Literary Society. Alhamdulillah, over the last few months we have been studying, talking about, looking into the life and the works of some of the Muslim thinkers whose work and thinking has affected the Muslim and has contributed positively to their identity. Uh, such as Allama Iqbal, Muhammad Abdul Wahab from Egypt, uh, Malik, Malik bin Nabi from Algeria, and many more. Alhamdulillah, today we are going to talk about Professor Mustafa, uh, Muhammad Mustafa Azimi, the Indian scholar who contributed hugely to preserving hadith and, and answering Orientalists when they brought some uh, doubt or some objection to the preservation of hadith literature. We move into introducing the presenter. Um, a bit about the ILS. Now, Alhamdulillah, the ILS was founded in 2019 with the aim and objective of uh, reconnecting, rejuvenating uh, the desire and uh, to uh, to to um, uh, connect with Islamic literature, both past and present, uh, to to reawaken the Muslim so that they can take pride in the history uh, through literature. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we do this by a number of ways. Uh, we have book reviews, we have book launches, we have uh, interviews with scholars and academics and thinkers. We have presentation like the one that we're going to do today, Alhamdulillah, um, uh, poetry events and various methods to kind of reawaken the desire to study, to read and write and, 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 and connect with, uh, with, with our uh, heritage, uh, literally heritage. presenter is Professor... Uh, uh, Aqil Azimi, the elder son of Muhammad Mustafa Al Azimi. Uh, Professor Aqil, born in India, uh, but he is currently living uh, at Saudi Arabia as a and working there in King Saud University as a professor uh, of computer science uh, for the last uh, twenty plus years. Uh, he did his uh, BSc in engineering from. Michigan University, uh, his MS, MSc and PhD uh, from Colorado University, again in USA. Um, Alhamdulillah, we are pleased to have you, and I thank you on behalf of the Islamic Literary Society. Uh, welcome to the show, Professor. Uh, thank you for your time. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, so, uh, my name is Aqil M. Azmi. Uh, I just said that uh, you can speak see the difference in name, how the last name is spelled, Al-Azmi and Azmi. Uh, my father's original name, how it was spelled, was Azmi uh, in English. That was when he had the Indian passport. Uh, but uh, in his work, he liked to keep uh, spell the name, how it was spelled in his later passport, the Saudi passport that he obtained later on. And he spelled it Al-Azmi based on uh, the Urdu or the Arabic spelling of the name the city he was born in. So, okay. So, my father was born uh, in the city of Mona Banjan, uh, that's Hazongar district, uh, Uttar Pradesh, British India, 1930. Uh, as I said, that uh, that's. Uh, circa date, uh, he wasn't sure when he was born. Uh, they, they did not keep a birth certificate at that time. So uh, he suspected either 1929, 1930, 1931. Uh, his first passport listed him as born in the 4th of April, 1930, but that was just, uh, just any date. And they did not ask for birth certificate. So just to put it, 1930. Uh, yeah, his mother passed away when he was quite young, uh, less than two years old, and his father remarried. So he had a difficult childhood because he had to deal with his stepmother. Uh, he had faced a lot of hardships uh, in his early life. He graduated from Deoband in 1952. 
and then after that he went for his master's degree in Al-Azhar University in Cairo and he got that in 1955 and then he got his PhD from Cambridge University in 1966. He worked in Qatar as a curator for the National Public Library, that's the Maktab al Qatar al between 1955 and 1968. And if you look at the, there's an overlap date between this and his PhD of 1966. And uh, the way it goes is that he worked in Qatar for over 10 years. And uh, that time they used to give the uh, three month paid salary for uh, the, any government job. I think they still do that. So, what he used to do maybe spend one month in India with his family and the, the other two months he just worked. So he collected uh, about two years worth of uh, summer vacations and he used it in a single shot to travel for his PhD in Cambridge 1960. He finished his PhD in two and a half years. So that was uh, quite interesting. Uh, the legally uh, you cannot finish your PhD in less than three years, but he finished it in less than two years, uh, two and a half years. After his PhD, he worked in Qatar for about a year and a half. But uh, since he got his PhD and there was no higher institution in Qatar, so he moved to Saudi Arabia. Uh, he moved to Mecca, and he taught in the College of Sharia. Uh, College of Sharia was at that time part of uh, King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah. And then uh, it was part of that. And then uh, later on, it was part of Umar Qura University. So he taught there for five years. Then he moved to Riyadh and he taught in King Saud University between 1973 to 1990. Uh, and then he had two sabbatical leaves, one of them University of Michigan in 1981 to 82. So he worked and uh, he taught there for two uh, for a year, a year and a half, and another year and a half in the University of Colorado Boulder uh, in 1989 to 1990. And then uh, he taught also for one year in Princeton University in New Jersey. He was awarded in the King Faisal Award in 1980. That was the second year the prize was initiated. It was initiated in 1979. In, to honor King Faisal, who died in 1975. So that was the second year for the awards. Uh, my father was awarded the prize in the second year. Uh, one of the most famous things my father did was, uh, he was the first to use computers to study Hadith. And uh, a big chunk of his life was uh, dedicated to this thing, about over 20 years. Uh, he passed away in 2017, about almost five years ago, Rahmatullahi uh, If you look at the map of uh, India, that's uh, how India looks like in Google map, and that's the map of India in detail. This is the state of Uttar Pradesh. It's quite a big state, uh, dense-wise, and population-wise, over 200 million people living in this red area. Uh, Delhi is in this part, and uh, Mo, is around this area of UP. So it's very close to Bihar. Uh, my father uh, was uh, really looked up, up to his father and mother. And some of his book, uh, like his PhD thesis, he dedicated it to his father, if you read that to my father who diverted my course of study from mathematics to hadith, but did not live long enough to share the joy of the first fruit. And uh, one of the later books, History of the Quranic Text, he dedicated it to his mother, for my dear mother, whose face I was too young to remember, whose greatest wish for me, as I was told later, was to memorize the Quran, and who I hope to meet again in the gardens of heaven, May Allah accept from us our best deeds, I mean. 
and he dedicated his last book, Ages Quran, Tamlis text. This is a book that was printed after he passed away, but alhamdulillah, he saw uh, a proof, press proof before passing away. And he dedicated it to my mother, who unfortunately also passed away a year after my father passed away. And that's Quran. So if I start with my father's childhood, uh, uh, the the Muslim community, uh, Azamgar and Mao, uh, it has a quite a big uh, Muslim population, about maybe 40 to 50 percent, and they are mainly involved in textile, uh, weaving uh, saris, uh, and everything related to saris, hand loom saris. Uh, his childhood was uh, spent in quite poverty. He, he used to walk uh, about five kilometers to the school just to study barefoot at that time. They were quite poor. And uh, he lost his mother when he was quite infant, about two years old or less. Uh, schooling, he had to uh, study and work. So my, no, actually his stepmother was not in favor of father studying in school. So he used to uh, spend a big chunk of night weaving and then so he can uh, say that I finished my uh, task for weaving for today so I can go to school the next day. And uh, since his family was quite poor, uh, he failed to skip a grade for one rupees. Uh, at that time, uh, any student who was uh, doing well in school, he could skip uh, one year in school. Uh, he was given a permission to skip from grade three to grade four in the middle of the semester, just by paying one rupee government fee. Uh, and he could not afford that. So they told me, okay, just stay in grade three. Uh, his only love in school was mathematics. And he loved that dearly. And there are several stories he mentioned about uh, how he enjoyed math. And that was the only subject he, he loved it dearly. And his love of mathematics, though his, my grandfather uh, asked him to switch to religious education, Dini Ta'lim, uh, my father was initially reluctant. But alhamdulillah, it gave fruit that uh, all the people who read my father's work, they say uh, is, does, uh, his work does not sound like someone coming from uh, someone who has studied just a religious background. Uh, he, when he was giving a lecture uh, in 1975 uh, in Chicago, and one of the peoples uh, when he gave the lecture uh, was from India, and he was a professor in mathematics uh, in teaching in Canada. And after the lecture, I asked father, uh, are you a mullah or a mathematician? And he said, why are you asking this question? He said that you, you're you speaking about Islam, but you're, the way you speak, uh, it's quite logical. Uh, it does not sound, it's coming from someone uh, who has just religious background. Uh, and there's quite logic to it. After uh, uh, so after finishing uh, the Darloom uh, uh, in Mao, he moved to Deoband and he got his uh, uh, graduation. Uh, that's what you call a BS type degree from Deoband, and it's dated 22 of the Hijra 19 or 1371 Hijra, which corresponds to 12th of September 1952. So this is his degree from Durban. Uh, if you look at his signature of all these people, and uh, yeah, if you look in, uh, there's another degree that lists all the Shiu who taught father and their senate. Uh, and Durban, uh, uh, they followed the old school that uh, when you teach a book, you have to teach it with a certain chain. It's not that you just pick up. Uh, 
uh, Sahih Bukhari from a bookstore and you teach from there. No, you have it to have it certified, uh, studied from a sheikh who also be should be certified from his sheikh. And this chain should go all the way to Imam Bukhari. Uh, this is my father's uh, chain. This is my father's name, Muhammad Mustafa Al-Azmi. And this is Imam Bukhari. So Imam Bukhari all the way to my father. My father's teacher at the Oman was Sheikh Hussein Ahmad Madani. Uh, he taught my father, Imam uh, Sahih Bukhari. So, and his sheikh was Mahmoud Hassan Deobandi. And you, you can look at the chain all the way to Imam Bukhari, about 22 different names. Uh, my father studied all the six books of hadith, Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, Tirmizi, Nasa'i, Ibn Majah, uh, all these books from different shiuch, and each sheikh his own chain to that. So then that sheikh was a chain all the way to Imam Tirmizi. There's a sheikh who has his chain to Imam Muslim and so on. And this is uh, this is how uh, the the books uh, used to be uh, spread. I mean, till recently when people have uh, stopped using this kind of chain system in uh, hadith transmission. Uh, later, when he finished his Dioban, he moved, uh, he got admitted to Al Azhar University in Cairo, and he graduated. Uh, he moved there, I think, in 1953, and he got his degree in 1957. He finished in 55, but the degree was issued later, it takes time to issue the degree. But this is the, his master's degree from uh, Al Azhar University. And this is one of the earliest pictures that I have of my father. Uh, that's around 1954, so he's about 24 years old. Uh, these are some of his colleagues from al -Azhar University. You can see he's still wearing the Indian Sherwani and uh, that uh, hat. He used to wear that um, uh, most of his life even in summer. Then uh, uh, when he finished from Azhar, he moved to Qatar and he found a job and he started working in the Qatar National Public Library and then uh, accumulating through uh, many summer vacations. Uh, two years worth of summer vacations. He spent it in Cambridge. He got his degree from Cambridge and that's a uh, dedication now, another day the forward by his uh, advisor, A.J. Arbery. And uh, the life in Cambridge was quite tough because it was a completely different environment for him. And uh, it was taking a big toll on him. Uh, he used to go, uh, to the university in the library, spent hours in the library, and then come home for uh, uh, to take me to school, uh, pick me up from a school. I was at that time a case doing like the kindergarten. And uh, after one year, he said that uh, he's planning to quit his PhD and uh, work in Qatar and then maybe return. Uh, my father told him no. Uh, it's better to continue finish your PhD because if you go back to Qatar and start working, people will most likely say that you have you could not finish your PhD. So I will help you with all the home chores, and you just concentrate on your work. So Alhamdulillah, up to the first year of uh, hardship, my father used to go to the library seven a.m. in the morning and worked all the way till eleven p.m. when they closed the library. So about 18 hours every day in the library, going through all the references. And my mom used to take care of uh, me, taking me to school, picking me up from school and buying groceries, these kind of things. So he finished his PhD in two years. And though the university regulation said, you have to finish in three years, you cannot finish in two years. And he required a special permission to finish in two years. 
and another permission he has the thesis was quite big uh, it was over 600 pages long and the university had a limit of uh, i think uh, maybe 5 400 or 500 pages so he had to re get another permission to have oversized phd thesis so after uh, getting his PhD, returned to Doha, Qatar, and has re resumed his work in Qatar National Public Library. He left Qatar in '68, since it has no college universities. He worked in Mecca, Kuliyat uh, al-Sharia, which is now part of Umar Qur University from '68 to '73. He joined Riyadh University at that time, which is now King's University in '73. He worked then till he retired in 1990. So. I will go through some of his works. Uh, there are two big things uh, in his work is the, his contribution to Hadith and Hadith science and his contribution to the Quran. Uh, in Hadith, uh, if you look at his uh, works, these are the title, Studies in Early Hadith Literature, Critical Edition of Sahih al Khuzayma, the four volumes, Sunan al Kubra al Nasa'i. Critical edition of Al Madini, Kutab al Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, says in early Hadith literature, that was his uh, uh, PhD thesis. And his main contribution was showing that uh, uh, the Orientalists uh, claimed that the Hadith was written uh, later, maybe 200 or 300 years after the Prophet was passed away. And this is wrong. He he compiled sources that showed the hadith was written uh, even during the first century. There are uh, references to hadith written in the uh, 80 Hijra, 90 Hijra, and so on. And that was uh, his main contribution in his PhD. He, he, I mean, he, he did that, compiled this work you know, through all the references. The another big contribution of Hadith that he did, he discovered uh, Sahih ibn Khuzayma. Not of you don't know that uh, there's another book called Sahih ibn Khuzayma. Uh, the book when it's, when you say Sahih, that means all the Hadith in this book are Sahih. They are the highest caliber Hadith. Uh, you can say A plus class of Hadith. And uh, ibn Khuzayma was thought to be lost. And a lot, a lot of people, uh, even 500 years ago, 600 years ago, used to say, I heard there's a book called Sahih ibn Khuzayma, uh, but we could not, we heard about it, but we don't know, we have never seen it. And accidentally, he discovered it in uh, uh, in one of the libraries in Turkey. It was miscatalogued, you know, in, let's say uh, in another book. So sometimes you find a book, say, uh, let's say this is a book about uh, fiqh, and then uh, sometime you find in the middle there are pages from a different manuscript just inside it, and that's how it is. But I don't know exact details, but it was it, that's the way how I discovered it. It was uh, misclassified. It was inside another book, completely different book, and it, he, he discovered it by accidentally. He wasn't looking for it actually. Sunan Nasai, that's another manuscript that he discovered in 1960 in Turkey. Uh, he edited Al Ila al Ila al Madini. Kutab al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here, he compiled a list of uh, the scribes who wrote for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Earlier authors, up to recently, they listed 42 scribes. Uh, my father uh, went through different references, and during the 500 years, no one was able to add new names, and he was able to discover 20 new names that he wrote for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This book was originally written in Arabic, but it has recently been uh, translated to English and is printed available. Manhaj uh, al and the Mahadithin with critical edition of Kitab al-Tamiz of Imam Muslim. Uh, this is one of the books that uh, a lot of people uh, didn't know exactly how the early Mahadithin uh, uh, used to uh, 
study hadith I mean, when you make a judgment on hadith what was what, what is your criteria and uh, though the early scholars used it but no one explicitly mentioned it and after studying extensively uh, he found uh, uh, kitab al tamiz and uh, and uh, Muslim and he briefly wrote about this thing and based on that he was able to uh, do an in-depth study and uh, he found that the exact criteria used by the early scholars to uh, critique the hadith and how they evaluated narrators the rasat al hadith al-nabawi tarikh tadwinu that's the arabic uh, version of his PhD thesis, that's an extended version of his PhD thesis. Hadith Methodology and Literature, uh, this is one of the books that he wrote uh, just uh, during one month time uh, as an introduction to Hadith literature for those people who uh, who are not uh, Hadith scholars, just for layman. Uh, on Shah's origin of Mohammedan jurisprudence, uh, Shah was one of the Orientalists uh, who claimed that all the hadith are fabricated. There's not a single hadith that's authentic. Uh, he built his work based on Margolius, and that's another uh, Orientalist from, uh, I think, Poland or Romania. Uh, my father. Uh, went through all his evidences and he critiqued them and he showed that uh, Shah either did not understand or he, you know, just tried uh, to fool people. Sometimes he did not bring all the hadith. He'd bring, uh, if you find 10 references, he'll bring five or six references and say, okay, this hadith, you can say yeah, this does not make sense and there's uh, missing chains and it's missing names. So when my father went through 40 examples that he used, he picked 20 examples from his book and he showed every example uh, that Shah was not uh, honest in his conclusion. Uh, critical edition of Maghazi Uru ibn Zubair. Uh, Uru ibn Zubair wrote a biography of the Prophet وسلم, and he was just a tabari. He was born in 22 Hijra and passed in 93. Most of people know that uh, the Sirat ibn Hisham, uh, he was a late comer. He, he died in 150 Hijra. So Uru ibn Zubair is a Tabari, and he wrote about Sirat ibn Hisham. So this, uh, he was able to counter the claim that the Sirat was written about 150 years about uh, Prophet Sallallahu death. Uh, he also uh, made a critical edition of Surah Ibn Majah, including the first computer-generated concordance of the Hadith. Uh, he found a very nice manuscript of Ibn Majah, and uh, he went through this uh, manuscript and then took the printed edition of Ibn Majah and re-edited it based on the, this very authentic manuscript of Ibn Majah. He compiled an abridged version of Riyadh al-Salihin, and then he worked around in having it translated in different languages, uh, uh, including uh, 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 Bosnian, Albanian, uh, Spanish, Azerbaijani. Uh, it came at a very crucial time. That was just during the collapse of the Russian Empire in, in late uh, 8990. Al Mahadiskun Mali Yamama, that was a work uh, to show that the Yamama region of Riyadh, the, the center of Saudi Arabia, a lot of people say that Riyadh has no history of scholars. And uh, he was able to show that uh, there was quite a, uh, quite a few big scholars who lived in this area. Uh, during the second and third century of Hijra. Another thing, he did a critical edition of Imam Malik in eight volumes. 
uh, he also printed the facsimile edition of Sahih Bukhari uh, that was uh, available in Kapulu Library in Istanbul. Uh, he found, sorry, he found this manuscript uh, back in the 70s and he was very much keen on having it printed. But it's a quite a big manuscript and you print it in color, it requires quite a big effort and financial and uh, big, quite big resources. So it, it took him 40 years to find someone to finance printing that book. Uh, this is one of the pages in uh, Sahih Bukhari. Uh, it's dated 725 Hijrah, if you look at the date. Uh, it says, you know, I'm not sure I, I saw the date, but it, it is, if you read the date, it says uh, this book was written in 725 Hijrah. Uh, the thing that gave the importance of this manuscript is not that just uh, its date. There are some older manuscripts, but this manuscript was read by very famous scholars. Uh, and this is one of the famous scholars, this one. All these uh, writing here are the signature by famous scholars who read this manuscript. So uh, all, when you, as I said, that uh, the way Bukhari and Muslim and all these things spread uh, through the chain narration system. So any person who read this book, he will write, I read this book, and then they sign it. I read this book. So when they reach, okay, today, in this day, I finished from this page to this page. Next day, they'll continue reading. They'll say, I marked, I finished till here. And they on. So and if this this is a hard copy. So anyone else comes after him, then uh, he will write on that. Uh, and I read this Bukhari from my sheikh to this page. So all these signatures of these famous people who read this copy of Sahih Bukhari. Uh, contribution to Quran. Uh, he has two major works, the history of Quranic texts from Revelation to Compilation, a comparative study with Old and New Testament. And uh, he showed that the methodology that was used by Zaydi Mithabit in compiling the Quran was uh, based on the law of witness that's described in the Quran. It's quite an academic book uh, and it's available. And I highly recommend people who would like to know exactly how the Quran was compiled. And it compares exactly the compilation of Quran and compared with how the Old Testament and the New Testament was compiled. And this is the page from his last book, Ages Quran Timeless Text, and a visual study of Surah 17, which is Surah Isra, across 14 centuries and 19 manuscripts. Uh, this work, was a culmination of 15 years of work started in the early 2000 and it just came out to press by the time he passed away and the idea was that uh, this is a visual proof that he picked surah isra which is surah number 17 uh, the whole surah isra and he picked a different mushaf so this is the mushaf that's presently uh, we get in the copies of the masjid that's printed in Medina, uh, printing press. Uh, this is the same mushaf after you remove that uh, the the tashkil, the decorative marks, and the dots. That's how it looks like. So this, now this is this line. This is from a mushaf uh, in the British Library, uh, and it's. Uh, from the mid first century, that's about 60 Hijra. It's not dated, but uh, uh, the scholars say that this, uh, the writing style is uh, Hijazi Ma'il, and it's, you can say it's about 50 to 60 Hijra. Uh, you can see uh, uh, Subhan, the way it's spelled here. Um, sorry, how, how can I get rid of that? Maybe. 
of it here. So subhan here, subhan, 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 all the way. It's the same spelling. So it shows you this is first century, first century, first century, and then uh, this is second century, and then the third century, fourth century, and then so on. Uh, I think one of them is uh, Ibn Muqla. Uh, I think this one is uh, Ibn Muqla, a famous scholar from the fourth century Hijra. And these are later ones. But you can say more or less the spelling of Mus'hab did not change, except later on they went Subhan, they put it explicit Alif. But then uh, uh, when they started uh, rewriting the uh, in Musaf Medina, they went to the old spelling, Subhan. You can say, Alladhi Asra Abdi Laylan, all this thing. And he went through all sort of Tisra like this, about 230 pages, word for word aligned. And you can see exactly the text of the Quran did not change. There's a visual proof of that. Uh, this is a picture of my father when he was awarded the King Face of the Word. Uh, 1980, that's him. You can see he's wearing the same his tradition dress, the old cap and the Sherwani. Uh, that's the uh, King uh, Fahad uh, was awarding him the King Face of the Word. And that's the certificate of the King Face of the Word. Uh, he won the award for three things uh, in his PhD work, studies in early Hadith literature, because it was a landmark, landmark work. Sahih ibn Khuzayma for discovering this manuscript and the use of computers for the service of Sunnah or Hadith. And that's the, the medal that came with the prize. And there was also monetary uh, uh, award with the, with the certificate. And he donated it to the uh, students uh, in India who were studying. Islamic studies. Okay, so Al Buf is uh, uh, the biggest uh, work in his life was the computer based study of Hadith. That's a picture of him uh, working in Hadith uh, using computer. At that time in the 80s, uh, the PC was just started popping up and they were not strong, uh, powerful enough for the shops that we had at hand. So this is a mini computer. That was occupying the whole room. There's a printer, you can see how big the printer is. Laser, uh, it's a line printer. So the idea of the using computer to study Hadith uh, started with uh, when he went to Chicago in 1975. Uh, Muslim student organization uh, organized a lecture uh, celebrating this 12th century of Imam Bukhari. One of the invited speaker was Dr. William Graham, uh, Doctor of Divinity from Harvard School. And he said that now people are discovering uh, computers and then we can use computer to find uh, some weaknesses in Hadith. He he's tried to uh, look professional, but my father understood what he meant. Uh, he understood that uh, what he's saying is that with computers, we can find a lot of loopholes in Hadith that the Muslim claims the Hadith in Arishan chains are continuous and all these things, and these are just uh, a hoax. Uh, there's no such thing. So my father uh, responded to him, all we ask for is a fair treatment of the subject, not a favorable one. And now he, there was a dilemma here. The, the problem is that if we do not do nothing, then you know the Orientalist will start using computer and say we used computer and we analyzed the text and we found there's uh, the problem. This hadith is uh, fake. This hadith problem. This hadith this kind of problem, and then you will end up with the never ending just re rebutting these people. It will be an endless cycle. So he said, why not we 
initiated the, the whole thing. If we do it, then no one will come. We, we say, we did the study and this is our results. And you, you find the problem, you can come and show us where the weakness in our study is. So you can cut the fraud on these people. And that was uh, his idea that uh, we should use computers to study hadith. And this thing uh, shaped his second half of my father's life. So that was in 1975. And in 1977, he went to USA uh, for a month and he was exposed to the computer for the first time of his life in uh, uh, there's an office called cultural society it was part of muslim student associations research wing and then he spent three summers the summer of 1977 1978 1979 learning the basics of computer what the computers can be used for uh, after he was convinced uh, he bought a terminal, a dumb terminal, uh, you can say an intelligent terminal, HP 2645. Uh, it, it looks uh, really primitive by the today's standard, which has 4K RAM. Uh, it did support Arabic, and that dumb terminal uh, weighed about 25 kilograms and cost about $6,000. Mm -hmm. uh, I can uh, I can go back to that picture. This is the terminal that I'm talking about, 2645. That cost 6,000, just the terminal. There's nothing. So it was used to input the data offline because there was no computer at that time. So the type is used to type one screen on uh, Hadith and save it on a mini cartridge. And they started with the Muslim Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And uh, now you would enter the text like this, uh, you need to put some kind of markers. And uh, there was uh, a person called uh, Dr. Ahmed Sharfuddin who was working in King Saud University's computer center at that time in, in College of Engineering. And he devised some markers. And uh, so we started uh, to put the markers in the hadith, embed the markers in the hadith. Like you can see the HTML markers, but that time that was, that was before HTML. There was no such thing. So there was just uh, a personal uh, HTHAD, you can say. And there was initially a few markers, and then we started with uh, adding new markers as we came across newer scenarios. So the initial markers were uh, something to mark the beginning of Hadith, the beginning of Matan of Hadith, the end of Hadith, uh, the narrator, uh, the beginning of the narrator, end of the narrator, the prime narrator, the the one who narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, just any person in the, and the name of the city. And how it used to go that my father, let's say, picks uh, uh, Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim, and then by, on, by hand, he marks, okay, uh, on the paper that, okay, is one, eight numbers, markers on the page, and the type he used to enter the text and the markers. Unfortunately, I don't have any copy left from these hundreds of notes that my father had. These are the snad markers. These are the snad markers and uh, include the advanced markers. Uh, these are markers used to mark the first narrator in the hadith, which is the sheikh of the one who narrated that book. Okay. So 118, and the name will be here, 118. Star T, there's some kind of another person involved. 18Q star T1, and then if there are more than one person. The narrator itself, the intermediate narrators are 1818 star and so on. The prime narrators and the others and the and these. So this quite elaborate is not taggers. Uh, this is one of from the one of the papers I just wrote recently, about two years ago, about how my father worked on uh, the hadith. So you can say the how it looks like. So uh, if you say uh, there's a hadith narrated one, the narrator A, so one eight 
one a a t x y z with the text then uh, one b plus c there's another narrator eight x y z and this is the hadith and that's how it looks like so these uh, markers allows you these kind of elaborate schemes in the chain because as you do more and more hadith you come across different type of narration chains and you need to encode them in a way that uh, the text will be there and you have just markers you move the marker and you have the pure hadith text and the markers allows you to retrieve and create this kind of elaborate it's not trees uh, this is uh, uh, one of the single hadith from sahih muslim uh, you can see the markers here i colored them in, in yellow and if you generate the chain of narrations you can see this you can see Anas ibn Malik, which is the, the prime narrator of narrated from the Prophet. And then these are people involved. You can see how it goes. Now, some of the challenges that we faced that the the the, the terminal that we started with did not have tashkil, no diacritical marks. So toward the end of 83. Uh, they started to appear hardware that supports uh, uh, Arabic diacritical marks when you have to write. Yeah, yeah you see here, Wahadatani, you see there's a Fatha, uh, Dal has Shadda Fatha, these we call Tashkil or diacritical marks. So, initial text when we entered did not have these markers, we just have plain text. Uh, Hadith books have all these markers, but the technology at that time did not support markers. So by 83, we had a lot of Hadith books were entered and it was too late to re-enter them. So there was two options, either to re-enter them or to work on a, a computerized system to put the skill. And uh, me, alhamdulillah, uh, worked along with my father to develop an algorithm, a two-pass algorithm to put tashkil on the hadith. So it goes to the hadith text and puts the tashkil. Uh, and uh, this way, uh, we were able to do about, uh, save five or six years worth of data entry. And the accuracy was acceptable. I mean, it was around 80% but it was better than uh, wasting six years. I mean, uh, it's easier that uh, you can ask the typist to go and correct the errors. Uh, now, based on the hadith, the, my father's initial, initial objective was to make concordance of hadith books, something like this. So yeah, when they say taqulina, and this is, uh, this is from uh, Surah Ibn Majah, uh, the index that we generated uh, in, in the Maja. Uh, you can see that uh, word, and this is a part of the hadith that taqum mustaqbal qibla wa taqum mutaifta minhum ma'am. And this is the number of hadith, hadith number as a reference. So uh, there was a work published uh, by uh, Brill in uh, 1940s. Uh, they did Majum uh, al-Fahris al-Fadr hadith, and they did that uh, using seven volumes, but it has about 30% missing hadith, a lot of missing, because it was done manually. So my father's initial idea was that to make an updated version of uh, concordance of hadith. So if you have you, you memorize one or two words of hadith, you can go to that text, uh, that uh, concordance, you look for the word, and then you can read from this. Okay, okay, yeah, I'm using, I was searching for this hadith. Okay, you can go. This hadith is 4006, so you can go back and read the hadith. So when we, we generated these indices, and then we typeset them using computer, and there was the first time using computer to typeset in Arabic. Uh, it wasn't typeset, I mean, uh, we did not want to type it, uh, you, you know, go to the typester to type it manually. So 
the computer generated the index and then we used and we developed uh, software to typeset on a typesetting machine. It was one of those first things that was done in our week. The second objective was to create a, a narration chain, a narrator's dictionary, marginal assembly. This uh, you can see uh, if you pick one of the Hadith books and you can see all these narrations. Okay, they, let's say if you pick uh, Sahih Muslim or Sahih Bukhari, all these names. And uh, this is the name and narrators. And the numbers indicate the term used uh, to indicate because when a narrator uh, narrates from someone, he used Haddathana Sama'na An Qala Wa Haddathana. So all these things uh, are, uh, these numbers indicate the terms used for the uh, narration. And then the reference. And the numbers here below are the indicator because each narrator was uniquely identified. So we used to do that for the whole, uh, uh, let's say Sahih Bukhari, the whole Sahih Bukhari, uh, let's say it might have about uh, 20,000 changes like this, but maybe five, 600 pages. So my father used to go through each one and then check and make sure that the, the computer identified uh, he, he found some errors. He say here. This person was wrongly identified by computer, so he corrected it. So, so it, it was a recognized person number thirty-two nine ninety. It was supposed to be thirty-two eight ninety. So it was meant to be a huge narrator's dictionary. Uh, his idea was that to make something similar like that. This uh, one hadith, and it's uh, one hadith that uh, he did it manually back in 1977. And you wanna do something similar that like you pick one hadith, like in the Malamadu bin Niyat, okay? And you bring all, wherever it occurs in Sahih Bukhari, maybe in one, two or three different places, Sahih Muslim, uh, Tirmidhi and Sahih, and you compile and you make a big map like that. And then you can study the hadith in depth like this, where it occurs. The third objective was that uh, uh, to uh, popularize the thing and uh, translate the hadith in different languages. And uh, this is, uh, sorry, an Urdu translation of hadith. Uh, we did a translation of hadith. Uh, initially, the idea of making uh, the hadith for the old Muslim Ummah. So the Arabic is the original, but there are people who cannot read Arabic. So the idea was we we'll pick certain hadith, translate them into English, Urdu, uh, other European languages, and Indonesian, those languages popular in the Muslim world. And uh, uh, we'll be part of that. So if you uh, retrieve a hadith in certain language, uh, it will, you'll pick up the hadith in Arabic and you ask for its English translation or the Arabic, it will bring it along. Uh, the fourth objective was that uh, by the end of the 80s, uh, the CD-ROM came into the market and we were the first to make a CD-ROM hadith. You say the date here is June 8, 1989. And uh, we wanted all the hadith the six books in the Musnad, uh, along with translation fit in a single CD. And then also uh, there was a plan to have a multimedia CD that uh, if there's a Ghazwa, then you can click and it will bring you a map of uh, Ghazwa Badr. Okay, where's Badr, uh, where's Badina, where's Badr and this kind of thing. The Hadith project, my father was working on Hadith project till late 90s. He, he was in US uh, from the 89 up to 97.
because he retired in 91. And uh, as I was studying, me, uh, my sister was also studying, doing her PhD there and I was doing my PhD. And my brother who was doing his BS, we were all in the same university. So my father said, there's no point he is staying in Riyadh. So he was in uh, Colorado uh, working on Hadith. Uh, I was helping him on the Hadith project along with my PhD work. When he returned to Riyadh in the just uh, early 98, 99, there was uh, a big noise about discovering uh, a new Quran manuscript in Yemen. And this Quran manuscript uh, differs from the one that people know. There was a big, uh, you can say, hangama that this one thing created uh, an article in the Atlantic Monthly, what is Quran? And the article, claimed that the Muslims are incapable of defending the Quran is the book of Allah. And they claimed the Sana'a manuscript they found in Yemen, uh, different from the one that we had in our hand. My father traveled to Yemen in March of 1999. He went to the museum. Uh, he was able to see few manuscripts. The, there was a German group who worked in Yemen for about 15 to 20 years. And they, about 30,000, 40,000 uh, loose papers of Quran, they uh, compiled it and then they photographed it and they kept it for themselves. They took it with them to Germany. Uh, they never gave it to the Yemen government. And they took a lot of copies of the fragments of the Quran with them to Germany. And so there was very difficult that uh, there wasn't much uh, thing that had people in Yemen and was just a few fragments in the library. So my father saw some of the fragments, but he said that uh, he had that uh, he should stop working on Hadith and go to Quran because Quran uh, takes precedence over the Hadith. And then he started working on uh, the book, History of the Quranic Text. And uh, that was, this is the first edition that appeared in 2003. And then uh, a second edition that came out in 2008, expanded edition. Uh, at the same time, uh, as I mentioned, that he worked on Surah Isra, uh, visual proof of the correctness or the stability of the Quranic text it is not it was untampered unadulterated uh this is the you have seen that earlier the printed page this is the exactly how we did it initially we did it that way and then we went that way and then the last the final version is the one i've shown you earlier so this thing was uh we did a trial and then uh, then we thought that to automate the whole thing and the reason my father picked Surah Isra is that Surah Isra is in the middle of the Quran. And usually the old, if you go to the Masahib, uh, the old Masahib, the first, second century, they lose the pages from the, either from the end, both ends. So he said, if you pick Surah Isra, if I'm middle of the Quran, it's best that. Uh, mostly you can find it intact. And that's why he uh, decided on Surah Isra. The biggest challenge was uh, co uh, collecting manuscripts. And he had to travel to different countries, different libraries, convince them to give him just photos of Surah Isra from all the manuscripts. And he traveled to Yemen, to India, to Turkey, to Tunisia for this sake. And then, as I mentioned, it took him 15 years from the inception to, uh, to have the book finally published. And it just came out after he passed away. 
uh, just like to talk the father as a human. I'm almost done, so just go through his. Uh, this is him in his final days. Uh, this is a home garden during winter. Uh, this is the picture of uh, us back in the early 90s in Colorado. Uh, that's me. That's my father and that's my brother, my sister and my mother. Uh, that's a picture of my father in Turkey in 2003. These are my kids, uh, Mariam, Omar and Ahmed. They, I think we were uh, near the Blue Mosque. Uh, that's a picture uh, uh, of us in India in 2004, Taj Mahal Agra. Uh, that's my father and my brother. That's about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And that's my father with uh, my brother's daughter, Isra. Uh, uh, these are pictures, uh, these are the relatives from my father's side. These are relatives from my mother's side. That's my mother's brother who also passed away uh, a year ago. And that's uh, one of his friends from India. And that's also his colleague from his childhood. And uh, there's also a picture of my father with the colleagues uh, from Turkey. Uh, there's Sheikh Akwa from Yemen. Uh, that's from Turkey. And that's someone's friends in, uh, in Riyadh at home. As I mentioned that uh, the hadith, my father had a snap to Imam Bukhari. And this thing have stopped. It's uh, something uh, people don't know about it. So back in 2003, my father started the same project again in Turkey. And then uh, that was 2003. And uh, he read uh, all the six books, Sahih Bukhari, Muslim, Nasai, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and Ibn Abi Dawood, to about 30 students and doctors uh, from different colleges in Istanbul uh, through a 30-day period. And then he gave them uh, Shahadat Ijazah. That means certificate that now you have a chain through him. So these people now can teach Bukhari and uh, they can teach I have Ijazah uh, from Sheikh al -Azami who has ijazah from his sheikh all the way to Imam Bukhari. So they have a continuous chain all the way to Imam Bukhari. Uh, I heard that uh, this thing have flourished in Turkey and there are about over 10,000 people who have ijazah since then, uh, during that 15 year period from when we started this project in Turkey in 2003 till now. These some other pictures, this in uh, Medina. And, and this is a home garden. And then uh, this is one of the last, this is a picture that I took of father just about 10 days before he passed away. And this is the picture. Yeah, he was looking at the proof copy of the, his last book, the Aegis Quran, Timeless Text. Just uh, uh, two months before he passed away. Alhamdulillah uh, Rabbil This is uh, his library, personal library. Uh, you can see it has about five to six hundred, uh, five to six thousand books. And after he passed away, we donated this library to the Khadun University in Istanbul. Uh, about six to seven tons of books were shipped to Turkey through airplane. Alhamdulillah, they are now kept in a section of the library uh, under my father's name. And Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So I'll stop here and uh, I'm sorry I've taken longer than anticipated. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Jazakumullah khairan, uh, Dr. Aqil, for this wonderful presentation and the life and works of your father, rahimullah wa ta'ala wa rahmatullah wa And 
I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, grant him a uh, high place in Jannah. And the legacy that he left for the Muslim is, you know, it's, it's amazing. So, um, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can ask uh, the doctor directly. I think that would be, uh, you know, uh, more fruitful. Um, if I can start off with Dr. Aqil. Um, what was his relationship after he engaged himself with the uh, Orientalist work, uh, Joseph Shark and, 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 and others? What response or attitude did he receive from the, 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 uh, the, you know, the scholars on that field, both from the Muslim and the non-Muslim? Was he accepted as a, a, a critique of that particular subject, as authoritative, or was he looked at as someone who's who just you know a, a Muslim just coming out and trying to s say something without a credibility? Now the reason I'm asking this because I've I've watched a few uh, critique of uh, uh, you know of him from an, some some non-Muslim, yep. and one of them actually said that he was like a passing time. You just just someone just passed by. You know I, I don't want to use that word for the sheikh, but he was indicating that he's he wasn't as significant in the. In, in in the field of academia. So what was what was the response from uh, colleagues who who's working on Islamic study and and hadith? That's my first question. And the, and the last one is, what was his advice to the Muslim? I remember watching an interview with the, the Saudi channel, where he kind of said that the Muslim should be very aware, very cautious of taking work from Orientalists, even if they are a bit favorable to Islam. So what, was that something that he, he held till the last day or did something change and he, he was more kind of open to other views? Mm -hmm. Regarding the first question, uh, what was the Orientalist? Uh, uh, you can see his advisor, A.J. Arbery and uh, Sargent. Uh, he wrote quite a, a very fine forward to his work, my father's work. But they never accepted him. When my father finished his PhD, uh, they asked him to write a certain article in one of those books they were compiling. And they ask him to write uh, a certain thing on hadith, like, like encyclopedia, something like this. Okay, so my father wrote an article and sent it to them. They rejected the article and they wrote just one line, too orthodox even for the orthodox. Okay, so my father said that that's not an academic response. I mean, you have to critique me if I did a mistake, something. No. So they actually ignored him. Uh, they knew that they could not respond to his uh, points. So the, the best strategy they followed was to ignore him. Even uh, during his PhD uh, defense, uh, you know, people are scared, you know, when you have to uh, defend your PhD in front of a committee. Uh, the persons who came to examine him, there was a person uh, from Professor Robinson from Scotland, he was also a famous uh, uh, Orientalist. They could not argue with my father any of the points that he mentioned. I mean, he went through his, they went through his work, checked reference by reference. My father uh, did not know that till uh, when they finished the exam, the, uh, that Professor Robinson gave him two pages with, okay, you made a mistake in uh, reference that it's supposed to be 92, not 29. Uh, you know, number swapping, this kind of thing. So they checked page by page each reference to make sure that my father was not uh, claiming otherwise. Uh, but they were never able to defend themselves. So the, the whole uh, PhD defense was about 20 minutes long. And the only thing the uh, gentleman, uh, Professor Robinson, mentioned that, please correct uh, uh, that 
you wrote the thesis in British uh, uh, Orientalist. No, I'm Scottish. Just change it to Scottish Orientalist. That was the only thing <laughs> he, he had to say. Okay. So since these people, are, I mean, uh, my father used to say these people are they know the truth, but rather, uh, I think their arrogance stops them from accepting it. So that's it. So when it comes uh, so with all this, his experience with the Orientalist, uh, he was very much reluctant to take anything from them. Uh, even if they claim something, uh, he will take it with a grain of salt. And he wrote that explicitly in his book, uh, History of Quranic Text, in the, either in the introduction or in the preface. He wrote, Muslims uh, should follow the uh, uh, saying by Ibn Sirin, one of the scholars, uh, uh, early Muslim scholars, who was alive in the Hijra. He said, This ilm is your deen. The, the knowledge of hadith and Quran is your deen. So beware of whom you take your deen. So don't take it from someone who does not believe in, in the Prophet uh, prophethood of Muhammad or uh, so if he doesn't accept Prophet uh, whatever he say, you, 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 you have to take it as a grain of salt. So it's better just to ignore them as they have ignored uh, him. So, just ignore them. Uh, any more question? Yeah, brother Imran was going to ask a question. Go ahead, Imran. Okay. Um, I've read uh, the Sheikh's books in English, and basically, I'm just trying to figure out. Even though he talks about hadith and you know hadith literature, uh, early hadith literature and everything, I was just wondering. As a person, like, what what's his fiqh, like fit background? Like, does he follow a specific school of thought? Because I'm I'm guessing he may be like Hanafi in Madhab, but uh, his books do not indicate anything. So I'm just trying to figure out like what he mm -hmm. followed in his you know when it came to fiqh and things like that. Mm -hmm. If you can yes. tell. He, he he was mainly following Hanafi, but uh, there are certain things that uh, uh, he wasn't following the Hanafi madhab in that. Uh, for example, uh, in the Hanafi madhab, when you have to do uh, jama'ah, uh, qasr, and uh, jama'ah bin salatain, when, when you're traveling, okay, uh, in Hanafi, I know that uh, if you're if you're traveling and you do jama'a jama in Dhuhr and Asr, uh, usually they say that you have to pray at a uh, time that's just close to end of Dhuhr and the beginning of Asr. That's that time is uh, to make jama'a bain al salat al Dhuhr and Asr. And uh, my father uh, did not. Uh, follow this. Uh, he found that uh, this is uh, actually a really Im impractical and uh, I think uh, in that regard he followed I think uh, uh, the, 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 the practice here in Saudi Arabia where uh, as long as uh, you can pray Jama'a Dhuhr Asr anytime between uh, between Dhuhr till uh, after Asr anytime in between because it's meant to make life easy for people if you're traveling. Uh, if, let's say if you're traveling by plane, so you can pray before boarding the plane instead of, you know, just wait. Because when, when you're traveling by plane, you cannot say when Doha is ending, when Asr starts. It's very difficult. So, so there are other things as well. So he was Hanafi, but uh, not 100% Hanafi. 
Any more question? Um, just last one from me. I mean, like I said, I I read a, the sheikh some some of his work, and I have so many, so much to ask. But um, you say he had a childhood uh, that was that was very hard and you know difficult. Mm -hmm. Did he ever mention to you that that his hardship actually led him to his his dedication to a scholarship mashallah he has achieved a lot including um the, the, doing the phd in two years time two and a half year so did you do you think from you you know uh, knowing he, you know uh, your discussion with him that his childhood had an impact on the way he looked at the world the way he dedicated himself to the scholarship yeah i think very much uh, you're right uh, he never mentioned explicitly, but yes, I mean, I, I can feel from his uh, saying when he talked to us about his early life from time to time that uh, his harsh life with his stepmother, uh, she was against his schooling. Uh, she preferred that uh, her, you know, children go to school and her father work. But her sons, uh, though they were given chance to go to school, they never succeeded. My father, with his harsh life, uh, it, it, he took it as a challenge, and he excelled in uh, alhamdulillah in uh, in everything he did. Well, on that note, um, you, just due to time, is as you know, it's, it's very interesting and very. Uh... Encouraging to know the Sheikh's biography, but like um, everything, the time is against us. Um, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Uh, Akil, for taking your time out and sharing the experience and life and work of your fathers. I'm sure, like me, everyone here, and in a greater, um, the, great, the, the greater Muslim audience, they will appreciate their work. And, and, and I recommend that everyone buys his work and keep it in the library. It is especially the Quran one. It is a masterpiece when it comes to uh, something, of, you know, in, in the English language. So, Jazakumullah for your time and everyone for attending. Can you just give me uh, just one or two words that... Uh, sure, go ahead, Doctor. Uh, yeah, I mean, just want to conclude that, uh, alhamdulillah, my father did his work. Uh, he... I mean, he, 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 you, you can say... Uh, he was an Islamic visionary. I mean, he really want Muslims to go back to their tradition. Uh, people are forgetting their old tradition and they're embracing uh, the, the modern lifestyle. Um, you cannot stop them, but at least uh, do not forget Islam. And then uh, Islam, uh, Allah does not need us. We need Allah. So, uh, please, if we have problem understanding Quran and Hadith, try to consult with the people of knowledge. Uh, don't read, uh, you know, books written by uh, Orientalists. Barakallah, certainly this is the case um, in the West. And your your father's contribution in the English language, that particular book, the Quran. Tech, Quranic text is, 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 is a must-have book for everyone. Um, with, inshallah, we have more program coming up. Uh, life and work of uh, Dr. Isra Ahmed, the life and works of Shibli Nomani in December. So please join us. Keep, uh, keep visiting the website, www.islamicliteracysociety.com and contribute by writing articles and suggestions and Jazakumullah once again for joining us Jazakumullah Sadaqil for joining us and on that note we will uh, leave inshallah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh ليس اليتيم الذي قد مات والده إن اليتيم يتيم العلم والأدب